All right. Good morning. Glad that you're all here. Welcome to Vista. Like I said in the video, that was too much of me, by the way. And was I that orange? I mean, I, it's my, like, my inner Donald Trump's going on, and we don't need that. Um, so anyway, glad that you're here. Hopefully you were able to hear all those announcements. But like I said, my wife and I and some friends here from the church were in uh, uh, Brooklyn, actually, is where the uh, Hillsong Conference was this last week. Just needed to take some time. Um, in three years of pastoring this church, I have never gone to a conference, so I said, I need to go be fed. I need to go hear from the Lord. And let me tell you, um, I, I'm spiritually fat because um, I was fed, and I am on fire. I am encouraged. So I, I hope you're ready for me to preach today because I'm going to preach. Um, a lot of times I teach, and I'm going I'm to preach today, and so I want to encourage you. Um, you know what? I have a word from the Lord for you today, and I've been praying about this, and I've been excited about this new series called First Fruits. This is really something I think we all need to hear, and you know, I want to challenge you every time, whether or not it's after I come back from a conference, or whether or not it's not, and it's the end of the summer, and it's the start of school. I really want to encourage us that when we have the opportunity to come to church, that we're not just going through the motions of going to church. We're not just coming in and saying we sing some songs, talk, pastor talks for a little bit, and, and then we get, a, you know, get some coffee and, and walk out. I, I pray, and my, my prayer for me and, and as well as you, is that we would really hear from the Lord. That we would hear every Sunday what God has for us to hear. Because every Sunday, every week, for that matter, every day, um, we need to hear something from the Lord. Amen? Do you believe that? That his words are life to us and we truly need to hear from the Lord. And so I'm, I'm excited to share with you what I have. And I've got a couple of simple questions to start off that I want to ask you. What this whole sermon, what this whole series, First Fruits, is about. And what I want to ask you is, what do you seek today? I don't mean only today, but in today, in today's life, in your life, today, tomorrow, what are you seeking? What are you truly as a human being, and whether or not you're a believer, as a Christian, what are you seeking today? Uh, because here's the truth, folks. You have to ask, what do you hope to find? If you're seeking something, then you're hoping to find something, right? If you're hungry, and we did this all over New York, all over Brooklyn, we were like, where do we go to eat with all the other 20,000 people at the conference? Where do we go to eat? And we pulled out our apps, and, and the question was always, well, you know, what do we want? Because whatever you want, that's what you need to go find. If you just start going, and if you start just popping your head into, and I did this, there were a couple of restaurants I wish I could have thrown up afterwards. Um, because I wasted my taste buds on something that had I known it would have tasted like that. One pizza in particular, I had a slice. And how many of you like pizza? Okay, yeah. And, 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 and you were here New York pizza? Um, it's, it's got a reputation. I love flat, thin. I'm not at Old Chicago or a Bojo's, you know, five feet of, of crust. I, I, I like the toppings and I like a little bit. Anyway, so I found this place. The first day we were there, it was called Artichoke Pizza. Well, it's called, you're not going to go, so artichoke pizza. And it had lines going out the door, way down the, the street. And I'm like, I'm not going to wait in my line for that. But the next day, we came a little bit later, there was no one. I'm like, yes. Walked right up, ordered me my favorite pizza, pepperoni. That's my favorite. I judge any pizza place based upon pepperoni pizza. You know, it might have artichoke. You might like artichoke heart pizzas or barbecue chicken pizza or all the other foo-foo fluff. I like pepperoni pizza. I ordered this. It looked amazing. It was as big as I was, one slice. And I had two, two, two plates to plate it. I folded it like you do. I folded it over. I bit into that thing. Grease flew just on my pants, on my shirt. My wife looked at me like, you're an idiot. What are you doing? We don't have any extra clothes. We have to go by. So, you know, I wish I wouldn't have gone there. I wish I would have spent a little bit more time seeking exactly with ratings and such what it is that I wanted to find, not just haphazardly going. You will find more often than not in life what you're seeking if you're really purposeful in the search. And so here's what I want to say. What you seek 
will oftentimes, more often than not, especially when it comes to faith, will determine what you find. What you seek will determine what you will find. If you got Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 4. We're going to look at a section of Scripture this morning that is really eye-opening in terms of first fruits and seeking and finding. You'll read in the first verse of Genesis 4. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son whose name was Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. She didn't get a doctor. She didn't get a lawyer. She got a farmer, and she got a shepherd. All right? Had they been doctors and lawyers, things might have turned out differently, but here's how it went down. Verse 3, in the course of time, Cain, it says, brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. He was a farmer, and so he brought some of his produce. But verse 4, Abel, it says, his brother, he brought fat portions from some of the... Now, if you're an underliner, if you're a highlighter, underline, highlight, firstborn of his flocks. That makes all the difference in the world to this story, and I'll explain in a moment. He brought some of the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord, it says, looked with favor on Abel and his offering, the fat portions. I, I like to believe that it was, you know, some fatty, some fatty, um, like beef, right? Some Wagyu beef with all the fat in it. Don't trim it off. Leave it. That's where the flavor is. He brought that fat portion, and he laid it before the Lord. Maybe a nice big T-bone. Um, and he just laid it out before the Lord. And so it says that the Lord didn't look on Cain's offering with favor, so Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. The Lord was pleased with Abel's offering, the firstborn, the fat from a firstborn, but he was displeased. He didn't have favor with Cain's offering. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. And so because God wasn't favorable towards Cain, Cain's offering... It says he was, Cain, very angry, and his face was sad. He was downcast. He was discouraged. He was frustrated. And so the Lord knows, and he sees, and he says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? What's wrong, man? Why are you depressed? Why are you discouraged? Why are you angry? What's going on? And Jesus, or God, said, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is right there. It's crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master that. And now Cain said to his brother Abel, if you're reading the New King James, it says that he wanted to talk with his brother. And so he said, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field... Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Now, you realize this, whenever in Scripture you read God or Jesus, God the Father or God the Son, asking a question of somebody, you got to realize he already knows the answer, right? That it's for us, it's for the person. Tell me what's going on. I already know what's going on, but I want to hear you say what's going on. You realize that's prayer? That's prayer. God already knows everything going on, everything that you need, everything that you desire that's good and right that he wants to provide. And so he wants to hear from us what we need. He wants to hear from us what our desire is because that's how relationship, he already knows. But we still need to verbalize that because there's power in words. You realize there's power in words. If I were to say to you right now, listen, that out in the parking lot, you didn't know this because you were here worshiping Julio and the band and the, and the team were doing a great job and you were focused, but I was out in the, in the parking lot and I saw, saw a guy wearing a, a rubber duck suit. And he had this rubber duck suit and on top he had this, this painted face. He painted his whole face red. And he was walking around and he was quacking like a duck. Now, what did you see in your mind? Because I verbalized, you saw a man in a rubber duck suit with a red painted face quacking around like a duck. Now, he wasn't out there. I made it up. 
But the reality is because I put words to that, you saw it in your mind. There's power in words. We see, and we don't even have to see in order to see. So the reality is God asked Cain, what's up, man? What's your deal? Why are you angry? Why are you downcast? Oh, hey, even more than that, can you tell me where your bro is? What did you do with Abel? And, and I, like, I like how it goes. He says, I don't know. He replied, am I my brother's watcher? Is it my job to keep track of Abel? When did I become his guardian angel, right? I mean, he's flippant. Not only is he angry, not only is he sad, downcast, but the Bible even then shows that he's flippant with God. He's, he's sarcastic with God. Let me know how far and long that gets you in life. When you're flippant and sarcastic with the creator of the universe. And so, verse 10, the Lord said, what have you done? Again, does he know? He knows. But he wants, in this case, Cain to be able to have to deal with it. What have you done? Listen, he said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. I know what you've done. You killed your brother. You spilled his blood. Lord, this morning, we pray that you would give us hearts that are seeking you. Hearts that are hungry for your truth this morning. Hearts that are receptive and open, not just going through the motions this morning but the hearts that truly want to see and hear from you. And so we open our minds to you this morning and our hearts, and it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray these things. And everybody said, the first thing I want you to know as you look at this story has everything to do with first fruits. The first thing I want you to know is that God is in to offerings. God is in to offerings. Now, now we don't know how it transpired with these guys. We don't know how it transpired. We don't even see Adam and Eve making an offering in this case. And we don't even see God prescribing to Cain and Abel how or what he wants to have them offer. But we know by inference that obviously God desired an offering because they brought one, right? They brought something to him in order to worship him, in order to glorify him, in order to honor him. That's all something we have to read into the story, but we see Cain and Abel bringing that sacrifice. Again, Cain was a farmer, and Abel was a shepherd, and they both brought an offering, and the question you want to ask is, what went wrong? Where's the problem? God is into offerings, and I've read a lot about this, and some people say the reason why God was pleased with Abel's offering and he was displeased with Cain's offering is because God wanted blood. Now, that's what the sacrificial system ultimately will be about as it's instituted and laid out. But the reality is we don't know that that's the case. We don't know if God said to them, give me blood, animals must die. Eventually, that would be the case. But we don't know if that was the case in the beginning. And I don't think necessarily we have to jump to that conclusion because if you read the rest of the law, especially in the book of Leviticus, what you realize is that God asked for five different types of offerings in his law. If he, all he wanted was one offering here, the offering of spilt blood by an animal, then why later on in Leviticus did he ask for five different kinds of offering? The first he asked for was a burnt offering. And this is when an animal was brought to the altar and the blood would be poured out on the altar, and then the whole animal would be burned on the altar. And this was a sign of worship and adoration to the Lord. You wake up and you say, man, I am just floored by how good God is. Why don't you go get, you know, the sheep that we love so much. We're going to take that, and we're going to give it to God. And, of course, the kids are like, what? No, the sheep. We love little Bobo. It doesn't matter. We, we've had Bobo for a while, but Bobo was raised. I don't know why Bobo. I like Bobo. Bobo was raised so that we could honor God with it. And so that's what you did with the burnt offering. The second offering was what was called a grain offering. And like it sounds, it's an offering that consisted of some sort of grain, not an animal. The only one that didn't require animal was this grain offering. And this was when someone wanted to dedicate the fruits of their labor to the Lord, they would bring in flour or baked goods with no leaven or roasted heads of new grain, and they would offer that, and it would be their sign of dedication 
to the Lord and the fruits of their labor to the Lord. Thirdly, you had a peace offering, and it's just like it sounds. Somebody would bring in a goat or a lamb from the herd, and this was meant to celebrate the peace that a person experienced between God and man through all the promises that God gives. Fourthly, there was a sin offering, and this offering atoned for unintentional sins. This sacrifice emphasized the need for atonement and the sprinkling of blood. This was also an animal. And fifthly, there was the guilt offering. Whatever else wasn't covered by the unintentional uh, offering before sin offering, the guilt offering would cover everything else. Any sin that somebody forgot about, offenses, breaking God's commands, and sinning against a neighbor along with the sacrifice, and that person then would bring that offering to the Lord and everything would be taken care of. So I personally find it hard to believe that really God was upset with Abel or Cain because he only brought grain. I think more importantly, why God wasn't pleased, didn't look on Cain's offering with favor, is because it was how it was offered. That's, I believe, the crux of this story. It wasn't what was offered necessarily, but it was how it was offered. Because in this story, men and women, I see two different types of believers, followers of God. Transition to today. I see two different types of, if you want to say now today, Christian, back then follower of God. Two different types of seekers. And again, I ask, what do you seek today? Pick it up in verse 3 again. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he didn't look with favor. So Cain, as we said, was very angry and his face was sad. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? I'm reading again for emphasis sake. Because I believe it's how it's offered that makes all the difference in the world. And so God said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what's right, will you not be accepted? In other words, you didn't do what was right. <laughs> but if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must master it. Folks, friends, what we see here are two different seekers seeking two different things. The first thing we see is Abel, and Abel was seeking, hear this, to prioritize his God. He was seeking to make God the top priority. He was prioritizing. We all know what it means to make lists, right? And when you make a list, you put the things that are most important where? At the top. This is prior to. That's what prioritize mean. A priori in the Latin. This goes before everything else. And what you realize is, in my opinion, what you see Abel doing is he was prioritizing his God. And what you see Cain doing is Cain was only merely placating his God. Two very different things. Making God the most important, the highest, the best form and place of my worship or just going through the motions because God said I should. And this has everything to do with first fruits, men and women. Because in the Bible, the whole concept of a first fruit, which is why I had you underline the firstborn, a first fruit is the very first thing from a harvest that you reap. It's the very first cattle, the very first animal. It's the best, it's the firstborn. In fact, there was even this concept of first fruit in the firstborn son. That would have the greatest priority, right? And so what you see is Abel seeking to prioritize. Might God his greatest, and Cain was seeking simply to placate his God. And we see it all the time. We see it all the time in faith. Some people say, I want God to be first and best in my life. Or... Others, I want God to be a part of my life, but not all of my life. Let me ask you a question here this morning. Which one are you? Are you seeking to make God the first and the highest and the best in your life? Or are you seeking simply to make God a part of your life? Yes, it's important. I love God. I, I, I know the Bible. I have a Bible. I know church, and sometimes I go. 
Or is God something that you are growing more and more and more passionate about? Are you wanting to make him the highest priority or is he just one of many things on the list? And you've got to realize that there are folks out there who are content with having God a part of their life but not making God the priority of their life. Are you with me? Do you understand? This is true for some followers of Jesus. I've got God in my life, but I don't want him to encroach on all areas of my life. I don't want him to say I can't do certain things. I don't want him to change every area of my life. I mean, I've already given him this much, but I'm going to reserve some of this other, some of my other things that I like to do that I don't want him, frankly, to get in there and mess up. You know what? I, I still want to move in with my girlfriend, even though I know the Bible says, you know what, to cohabitate, to have sex outside of marriage is fornication. But you know what? Uh, it's, it's just, I'm going to set that one aside. And I could give you a list, because they're out there, of all the things that people do when they deprioritize God and find a greater priority in the stuff of this world. And that's where it is that you find Cain, and that's where it is that you find Abel. You see, God wants the best, and God wants our best. Amen? He wants your best, and he wants my best. God was into offerings. And the reality is, it was everything to do with the heart of those who brought the offering. Cain's attitude shows his heart. He was angry. I mean, <laughs> it just blows me away. Why would Cain be angry about something that he did? Why would he get angry at God? Now, obviously, he's angry at his brother, isn't he? I mean, you don't take someone out in the field, have a little bit of a tongue lashing, which is what the New King James said they did. He went out and he wanted to talk to his brother. And you know how that conversation went? Dude, what are you doing? You made me look bad. Well, I did what? Yeah, you brought that firstborn, the fat of your firstborn. And you know what? Frankly, I thought we were saving that for a really good party. But what are you doing? Because then I just brought some of my, you know, just stuff, my leftover stuff, not the best stuff. And God was happy with you and not with me. You made me look bad. It's what we do. We blame others. We blame others for our own decisions. We blame others for our own inadequacies or deficiencies or unwillingness to give all when someone else, well, you know what, at work, someone's given 110% at the job and you want to give 75%. People go to this person and they say, hey, chill out, bud. You're making the rest of us look bad. Now, it says that he talked to him, and then ultimately what he did was he took care of him. He talked to him, and then he took care of him, which meant that he killed his brother. He spilled his blood. He was that angry with what Cain or what Abel did and how it made him look. And then that anger didn't dissipate when the source of the anger was gone because God looks and sees that he's still angry. And you can deduce that he's angry with God too. Why are you requiring me to give in the first place? Oh, you churches, you pastors, you just want our money. You just want our stuff. I love it that we don't take an offering here at Vista Church. We do. We have boxes in the back. But I love it so that if you invite one of your non-Christian friends, and I pray and I hope that you continue to do that, that you start doing that, that they might come and hear from the Lord and how much he loves them. I love that they can't walk out of here and say, oh, see you Christians, you just want our money. You know what? That's between you and the Lord. I don't keep track of who gives what. I don't know who gives what. What you put in that box is between you and the Lord. And I have an accountant that takes care of all the other stuff and then sends out the end of the year giving because I want to minister to everybody the same. I don't want to see you as a $4 signs or $2 signs or half a dollar sign. I want to see you through the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? But, but here... But, <clears throat> Here's what people still would say. They get angry at God because they see church. It was just about the money. Oh, well, do, do, you, do you know what they do? And do you know what they bought? And you know how much that TV was? Oh. And then we get angry that God even wants us to invest in his kingdom work in the first place. Cain was angry with God. Cain was angry with his brother. In fact, Cain looks and he said, I gave you a nod. I did what you asked of me. You said to bring something, so I did. Why wasn't that enough? 
I went through the motions. Why wasn't that enough? Hear this, folks. One brought what was required, and the other one brought what was needed. One brought what was required, and the other one brought what was needed. And those are two very different things because, you know what? Cain brought what was simply required. You said, bring an offering. And Abel looked and he said, I'm going to bring what is needed. You know, I was on the way back from the flight yesterday, or excuse me, on the way back from New York yesterday, I was uh, trying to put, put the finishing touches on this sermon, and I changed the whole thing this morning to 4 o'clock anyway. But uh, I was on the plane, and I had my computer, and, and I wanted to really just spend some time. And, and as I sat down uh, in, the, in the seat that I had, all of a sudden, I realized very quickly that there was a screaming, crying baby back behind me, right behind me, in my seat, behind it. Um, and she had a sister that was like a year or two years older than her. And uh, I would love to tell you that everything calmed down. But arguably, and there's a point of difference between me and the friends that with win us, uh, she, in my opinion, she cried throughout the whole flight. Now, my friends said, no, she didn't. But they had these big, huge headphones that were over their ears listening to music. One of them was like, like, uh, like he's out. And the other one was just like, you know, bebop watching her movie. And, and I, I, all I had was these little tiny headphones. And I, I put them over my ears, um, and my computer died um, because I was editing video as well, that video. My computer died, and so I'm like, what am I going to do now? I can't work on my sermon. I paid the $8 for the Wi-Fi so I could download stuff. That's trashed. Um, I'm going to listen to, no, I, I can't listen to music. You know why I can't listen to music? Because I forgot my, my dongle. I know that sounds bad. I forgot the Apple dongle that's supposed to go with my phone and my headphones, and so I couldn't plug that into my phone that has my music that I wanted to drown out the ah! screaming, crying baby, and she was screaming and crying. And so I just put my headphones on anyway, and my wife said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, she said, well, why don't you plug it? I, I, I can't. Well, then why do you have your headphones on? I said, do you hear this? And you know what the reality is? I forgot what was needed. I didn't bring what was needed. I brought what I thought was required, which is my headphones and my, and my phone. Thought I'd be able to, you know, drown out. But I didn't have what was needed, which was that little connection point, that dongle between the two things. And you know what? We won't find what we're seeking in life if we bring only what is required. We also need to bring what is needed. That is huge, folks, because secondly, God cares more about how we offer than simply what we offer. He cares about the attitude of the heart in what you bring to him. My old boss up in Vancouver, Washington, when I first started in ministry, a um, phenomenal guy. I learned so much from this man. And, and I watched him do ministry, and I watched him challenge, much like what we're doing, bring in different things for backpack drives. And, and he uh, one time asked folks to bring in some furniture um, to help uh, furnish this new portion of the church, kind of the counseling center. And then I watched people, and he did because, you know, he was focused on it. I watched people, and he did bring in a bunch of trash, he, he called for furniture and couches and chairs so they could furnish this new counseling center. And people brought their junk, stuff they wanted to get rid of, stuff that they didn't want anything to do with anymore that smelled and had stains all over it. And I watched this man get so angry. He was frustrated with the lack of heart. Yes, they did what was required, bring something in. But what they brought and the attitude that they brought, it wasn't what was needed. He, he challenged the congregation in the most loving of ways. Folks, if it's worth giving to God, then it's worth giving sacrificially. That's what you see the difference between Cain and Abel. You see the difference in their attitude and in their heart. Not only what they brought, one brought fat portion from his firstborn, another one brought just some of the produce from the land what, that wasn't his best, and God looked, and he knew this wasn't his best. It was all about how he offered. The heart of the seeker matters to our God. Amen? 
Your heart matters to God in how you seek him. Seek me with your whole heart, the Bible says, and then you will find me. You don't seek God with a 10% portion of your heart and hope to find him. You don't seek God with 50% or 80% or even 95%. The Bible says that when you seek God with all your heart, with your whole heart, then you find God. That's what it looks like to be all in, folks, to use last week's title, to be all in with the Lord. It reminds me of David. Remember David? David did something atrocious with Bathsheba, committed adultery, and then to cover his sin, he uh, had the husband Uriah murdered by one of his soldiers, and everyone pulled back, and Uriah was struck down. David thought he hid the whole thing, thought he got away with the whole thing, and then ultimately God sent Nathan to David to confront him. Did this whole little spiel about a sheep and one person who had a lot, another one who had only one, and that person came and stole the one, and David was incensed. That man deserves to die, he said. He was passionate. It's not right. And then Nathan looks at David and says, dude, look in the mirror, man. You're the man. This is you I'm talking about. God knows what you did. And David was broken. And David, on the heels of that, he confessed. And we have one of the most beautiful psalms in all of the Bible. Psalm 51 is David's confession about what he did, about his sin. And I want you to hear what David says. Psalm 51, verse 7. David says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, he's speaking to God, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. He got broken by God. He got crushed by God. He got confronted by God, and he wanted on the heels of that not to be angry like Cain, but instead he wanted to rejoice in his God. He says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a pure heart, clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then, when that happens, then I will teach transgressors, sinners, your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. He was the king. He was a prophet, and he was the king. And then I will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You don't delight in what? You don't delight in sacrifice. Or I would bring a sacrifice. You don't take pleasure in what? Go back and look at the five kinds of offerings. The one was called a burnt offering, and that was to cover, and it was actually to be praise. He says, you don't desire that. Instead, he goes on to say, the sacrifices of God, what God is looking for is a broken spirit, a broken, and what kind of heart? A contrite heart. That's the attitude in the heart. It's not what David brought. He says, you don't even want me to bring anything. You don't need anything because that's just going through the... And you know what, folks? A lot of Christians just go through the motions on Sunday mornings. They just show up at church because that's what you do. Sometimes they fall asleep. Some, not you folks. I'm not talking about any of you folks. You guys are all just like, oh, yes. That's amazing. Yeah, say it again taking notes, and I mean, I'm not, but there are a whole host of believers that they don't come expectant to hear from God, excited to hear from God, they just want to go through the motions and do what's required of them, and then walk out the doors. You don't desire, put it back up again if you would, the sacrifices of God, David says, are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, that you will not despise. I love it. That's what God is looking for, and that's what David brought. He brought a broken heart, a humble heart, a heart that realized how much he needed his God. Do you know how much you need God this morning? What are you seeking today? Whatever it is, folks, more than anything else in this world, not pleasure, not position, not accolades and honor, not wealth and money, not all the things that this world has to offer, here's what I think. I think, in my own life as well, more often than not, 
We're asking too much of this world and not enough of our God. Are you with me? We're asking too much from this world to satisfy us, and we're not asking enough from our God who can satisfy all of our desires. You see, here's what I want you to hear. God cares more about how we offer what we offer. And then the question you need to ask and answer is, what then do you offer to God in your life? You here this morning, what do you offer God? What do you give to God? Now, if you were singing earlier this morning, the Bible says you were offering a sacrifice of, you offered him a praise offering. Awesome. God loves our praise offering. He's blessed by it. But some of us do this during the praise offering. Now, I'm not judging anybody because maybe you just, your voice is that bad. <laughs> and so then maybe the around you, everyone's thinking, thank you. Appreciate the fact. You know what? But here's the reality. That's why we turn it up because it doesn't matter what your voice sounds like to God. From, from you and I, what God hears is a pleasant aroma. It's that burnt offering, that offering of praise is what you and I give to God, and it's our voice. What do you offer God? And I'm going to challenge you as I conclude this morning, as we start this series, I'm going to challenge you, and I know some of you thought this is going to be all about money, because I said a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to do a series on money, first fruits. This is about money, but I want you to hear it's about so much more than just money. This is about who we are and how we bring what we bring to our God. This is about Romans 12.1. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable act of worship, he says. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, which is all about give me, give me, give me. No, offer your bodies to God. Here I am, here I am, here I am. Amen? And then when you do that, Paul says, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, his pleasing, and his what kind of will? Oh, I thought it was on the screen. Sorry about that. His perfect will. So folks, the reality is we need to stop and we need to say what you offer to God is directly related to what you hope to find from your God. What you expect to receive from your God. Little offering, little expectation. Giving him the best of what you have, all of what you have, not just what re is required, but what is needed for the moment. That's when you and I can expect to receive so much back because the Bible says you reap what you... That, that's a principle that people just hear and they don't believe. It's not Christian karma. That's not what this is. You reap spiritually what you sow. You offer your best and your most to your God, your relationship, your life, your heart, your mind, your body, your soul, your spirit. You offer the best of what you have to God. And what is Abel here? He looked on it with favor. You offer the least, the, the smallest, the, the, the amount that, you know, oh, hopefully he'll, he'll be pleased with just this little. He knows already. You know what? And little offering there's little expectation in terms of what you're going to find. So let me say again, what do you seek today? What do you hope to find today? Too many people today expect too much from this world and not enough from their God. And that can't be the case with us. Amen? I want to encourage you this morning. Expect more from God and satisfaction from God than the stuff of this world. Because as time goes on, our world is going to get more and more ugly and Christians are going to get more and more and more sucked into the stuff of this world. And the love of most, the Bible says, in the last days will grow cold. But not our love. We're not going to grow cold, are we? We're going to keep on fire for Jesus Christ. I pray that that's the case in my own heart. I loved going to this conference because God filled me up with His Spirit and reminded me again when I was first saved. I was like, yes, I'm full of the Lord. You know what I did last night? I watched four more sermons, and I got up at four this morning, and I listened to a bunch of worship stuff. That's what I did back 20 years ago when I accepted Jesus. Yes, I love it. I want to be on fire for the Lord. And as long as I'm on fire for the Lord, I'm going to encourage you, let's do it too. Join me, amen? You don't want to just come and watch someone blazing on stage and then sit out there all cold. You want to blaze too, amen? 
And I'm not pitting myself against you. I'm saying, let's do this together. Let's go after God all in like Abel, best of what we got, all of what we've got, all that we are. We're going after God. What do you hunger for and thirst for today? I close Matthew 5, 6. This is my third close. I'll have one more. Um, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Not for the stuff of this world. Not for the ways of this world. Not for the hope of this world. Blessed are you when you hunger and you thirst for God's stuff that satisfies and that lasts for eternity. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? Because when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, God's going to fill you up. Who wants to be filled this morning with joy and peace and hope and life and all the stuff of God? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. The band's going to come up. <clears throat> We're going to have a time of communion. Uh, they're going to sing a song, come to the altar, and while they're singing this, I want to invite you, let's do the outside rows first, and then after the outside rows, come forward and get the elements. We'll have the inside section come and grab the elements, and then I want you to take those back to your seat. And we're going to take these elements together. I'll come back out. I'll pray for these things. I'll have another sermon to give. And then we'll take, I'm kidding. Then we'll take the offering together. Or we'll take the, uh, the elements together. Will you stand with me? Lord, we're thankful for your shed blood and your broken body on the cross for our sins. We're thankful that you died to set us free. We're thankful that in this offering that you gave, you gave your best, you gave your all, you gave your life. Lord, we're thankful in that, that the Bible says you cover over a multitude of sins. And so this morning, we want to worship you and give you thanks. And remember, you're all in sacrifice for your creation. And Lord, in response, I pray you would probe our hearts, show us where we need to be more in, where we need to be more committed, more involved, more going after God than we have before. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray these things. And everybody said, outside rows, come on in.